Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated during the presentations. The President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress, March 3, 1863, has awarded in the name of Congress the Medal of Honor to Staff Sergeant David G. Bellavia, United States Army. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. Staff Sergeant David G. Bellavia distinguished himself by acts of gallantry and intrepidity above and beyond the call of duty on November 10, 2004, while serving as a squad leader in support of Operation Phantom Fury in Fallujah, Iraq. While clearing a house, a squad from Staff Sergeant Bellavia's platoon became trapped within a room by intense enemy fire coming from a fortified position under the stairs leading to the second floor. Recognizing the immediate severity of the situation and with disregard for his own safety, Staff Sergeant Bellavia took up an automatic weapon and entered the doorway of the house to engage the insurgents. With enemy rounds impacting around him, Staff Sergeant Bellavia fired at the enemy position at a cyclic rate, providing covering fire that allowed the squad to break contact and exit the house. A Bradley fighting vehicle was brought forward to suppress the enemy. However, due to high walls surrounding the house, it could not fire directly at the enemy position. Staff Sergeant Bellavia then re-entered the house and again came under intense enemy fire. He observed an enemy insurgent preparing to fire a rocket-propelled grenade at his platoon. Recognizing the grave danger posed by the grenade to his fellow soldiers, Staff Sergeant Bellavia assaulted the enemy position, killing one insurgent and wounding another who ran to another part of the house. Staff Sergeant Bellavia, realizing he had an uncleared, darkened room to his back, moved to clear it. As he entered, an insurgent came down the stairs firing at him. Simultaneously, the previously wounded insurgent re-emerged and also engaged Staff Sergeant Bellavia. Staff Sergeant Bellavia, entering further into the darkened room, returned fire and eliminated both insurgents. Staff Sergeant Bellavia then received enemy fire from an insurgent emerging from a closet in the room. Exchanging gunfire, Staff Sergeant Bellavia pursued the enemy up the stairs and eliminated him. Now on the second floor, Staff Sergeant Bellavia moved to a door that opened onto the roof. At this point, a fifth insurgent leapt from the third floor roof onto the second floor roof. Staff Sergeant Bellavia engaged the insurgent through a window, wounding him in the back and legs and causing him to fall off the roof. Acting on instinct to save the members of his platoon from an imminent threat, Staff Sergeant Bellavia ultimately cleared an entire enemy-filled house, destroyed four insurgents, and badly wounded a fifth. Staff Sergeant Bellavia's bravery, complete disregard for his own safety, and unselfish and courageous actions are in keeping with the finest traditions of the military service and reflect great credit upon himself and the United States Army. At this time, the Medal of Honor flag will be presented. On 23 October 2002, Public Law 107-248, Section 8143, established the Medal of Honor flag to recognize service members who have distinguished themselves by gallantry in action above and beyond the call of duty. The Medal of Honor flag commemorates the sacrifice and bloodshed for our freedoms and gives emphasis to the Medal of Honor being the highest award for valor by an individual serving in the armed forces of the United States. The light blue color with gold fringe bearing 13 white stars are adapted from the Medal of Honor ribbon. Ladies and gentlemen, Staff Sergeant David G. Bellavia. 
Good afternoon. The Honorable David Norquist performing the duties of Deputy Secretary of Defense. The Honorable Ryan McCarthy performing the duties of Secretary of the Army. Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, General James McConville. Sergeant Major of the Army, Daniel Daly. And my Congressman, the Honorable Chris Collins, U.S. Representative of New York, from New York. Ram Rods of 2-2 Infantry. There we go. Uh, family, my mother, my brothers, Dan, Rand, Tim, Deanna, my kids, Evan, Aiden, and Vivian. Thank you for your support. Your presence and my good fortune to be able to share this occasion with my men, my family, my friends has eased the awkwardness that I'm feeling right now. What's more, I'm especially proud of the recognition that this award brings to my unit, my leaders, and my peers of the mighty ramrods of 2-2 Infantry, 3rd Brigade, 1st Infantry Division. Combatants bear witness to all aspects of the human condition. It reveals the darkest parts of the human soul while residing side by side with the most exalted characteristics, nobility, honor, valor, and God's grace. Why do American warriors under fire do what men have done since this nation's inception? This is a common thread that connects the militias of Lexington and Concord with the warriors of Fallujah. It is our love of nation, our way of life, and our love by those who we serve with side by side. We defend, we avenge, we sacrifice, we bleed, and we are willing to die for this unique creation, the United States of America. I am complete for having experienced that kind of sacrifice with my fellow men at arms. And those who died, they gave their lives for me. They gave their lives for you and countless citizens who will never know them. I'm talking about Sims, Falkenberg, Iwan, Gonzalez, Vandenberg, Madison, Gariantis, Shrek, Sizemore, Mock, Rosales, Cardenas, Sprayberry, and Pruitt. Those were our countrymen. Those were our friends. And these men will never get the chance to experience the cycle of life, the birth and growth of their children. They shall not grow old because they chose to stand in our place and face the enemy for us. It's not enough to acknowledge the fallen by name or just inscribe their names in marble as proof that they lived and died. To truly honor the fallen, we must acknowledge how and why they gave their lives. Their death wasn't a random act or a splash of misfortune. These men and women voluntarily put themselves in harm's way, prepared to die so that we may rest secured at home. They are the insurance policy that guarantees that our founding documents, our God-given rights, are more worthy than their own tomorrows. When the news that Falkenberg, Sims, Madison, and Iwan had fallen, the reaction, the shock, the disbelief, the grief, it was transformed into resolve and rage to complete the mission assigned to us and give us even greater tenacity under fire. Their sacrifice gave us clear focus to fight using a reserve that we never knew we had. We broke the will of our adversaries, the enemy was defeated, and because of that, we came home. For the infantrymen in combat, there is nobility and purpose in our lives, and that is unique. But we don't see ourselves as a people apart. We are America's warrior class. We are citizens of the United States and treasure this land more than any overseas posting. The Army provided me with purpose and appreciation for the blessing America has bestowed upon us all. I am forever grateful to the United States Army for making me able to count and cherish those blessings in a way that is unique to most and to those who you, the, you wear the uniform. I think the uniform, I think my army has made us all better men, fathers, employees, husbands, and citizens. 
The controversy that swirled over the Iraq war was not a departure from other wars that America has fought. Just a short distance from where I grew up in Orleans County, on the Canadian side of the Niagara River, it was settled by loyalists who supported King George. With the exception of the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, open dissent has been at the core of our very being. And war has never been particularly a popular undertaking. American soldiers have never confused the United States with Sparta. The best leaders in battle become that way by being loyal and dutiful subordinates. We don't get a vote. We execute the lawful intent of our government. There is no political affiliation on our dog tags. We continue the war legacy of the United States without regard for adulation or unanimous approval either. The Iraqi veteran has maintained and in many circumstances far exceeded the highest traditions of military service to this great nation. Of the 1.5 million men and women who have served in Iraq, the valor they displayed was often subsumed by political rhetoric at home. But that in no way diminishes the accomplishment of our troops or the accomplishments of my generation at war. The award is recognition of that, and it should be seen as a validation of our efforts, not as a reward for the action of one individual in one house in Fallujah. When I think of Iraq, I think of Colin Fitz, man shot by three separate weapon systems. Nobody would have raised an eyebrow if Fitzy retired. Instead, Colin Fitz returns to combat duty for two more years to shed more blood for this nation that he loves. When I think of Iraq, I think of Chris Oley, the young saw gunner whose job it is to open doors and put down a reflexive fire to people who happen to be shooting back at him. And he was able to do that because behind him was Sergeant Warren Misa, ready to pull him out of that doorway and undoubtedly save his life. I have Chuck Knapp, my team leader, Chuck Knapp saved our entire 3rd Platoon Alpha Company 2-2 when he stopped us from entering a building contained IED that would have killed all of us. I think about Max Field, my saw gunner, who asked our Doc Abernathy to fix his injured foot in the prone position so he could continue to knock down targets under fire while he was getting fixed up. My guy John Ruiz, who shielded the body of his buddy from incoming fire, without fear of risk to himself. When I think of the Iraq war, I think of Piotr Soholis, brave, strong, and steady. Our engineers who devised and deployed remarkable weapon systems that saved countless lives. Our tankers, 27 cavalry on the other side of Fallujah that hardly gets any notice for what they did. There were indispensable Bradley crews who busted through walls. Omar Hardaway, James Cantrell, Chad Ellis, who without a functioning 25 millimeter Bush Master, Master Cannon or tow or coax, and let's not discuss how that happened. He used his rifle to suppress the enemy. Corey Brown, the grizzly bear from Montana. Shane Gossard, humble, beautiful, kind. Brad Utesayer. Dalalu, the Bradley teams and those crews are the reason why children have fathers today. And those teams shielded our dismounts from rocket fire that were meant to take our lives. Corey McFadden, John Bandy, Wilson, Gary Fry, Kane. They never took a step backwards under fire. Sergeant John Gregory is one of the toughest, most decent men I've ever served with. He had a tour from hell a year after we came home. Our drivers, Marcotte, Gonzo, Woodbury, Hunter, Perez, they got us there, they needed where we needed to go and they did it with bravery and valor. Iraq makes me think of Victor Santos, a fiery brave soldier who cut his combat teeth at Iraq and went on for more in a ranger regiment. McDaniel and Swanson, Young kids shouldering 240 Bravos on their shoulder, suppressing enemy fire from feet away. I had Stuckert, I had Metcalf, I had Flannery and Gross, and I had our door crushing He Man, Hugh Hall. That is my Iraq war. And it makes me proud to have told my dad no to dental school. 
I learn, no, I learn much more from living and fighting with these men than I ever could have from a lifetime of doing root canals. <laughs> My unit's leaders died leading men from the front. When our company commander, Sean Sims, our company commander, he was killed in a house fight. Joey Seaford and my interpreter, Sammy, who just became a US citizen a week ago. Yeah, you can clap for that. Joey Seaford and my interpreter, Sammy, were there to engage the enemy in efforts to save my company commander's life. Seaford engaged the enemy and threw his weapon at him, engaging him with the buttstock of his rifle after being shot in the shoulder. Travis Barreto and my first platoon fought their way to extract wounded and fallen ramrods under intense enemy fire. My Iraq war I had Captain, now Colonel, Doug Walter. I had First Sergeant, Retired Command Sergeant Major Peter Smith. These were company leaders who put aside loss, put aside trauma to direct young warriors during the most stressful times of our lives. Young lieutenants like Chris Walls, Jeff Emery, Lieutenant Menno, they learned how to lead and cover down when their peers had fallen. And finally, there's Scott Lawson, a true friend. We lost him in 2013. He entered the house with me that night in Fallujah. He gave me strength, he gave me confidence that allowed me to survive that night and many other nights since then. And I gotta mention this guy, Michael Ware, a combat journalist there to cover a story and becomes part of the story. You know, before I got to know him, before I got to see him in action, I would have told you he was 100% worthless and a nuisance. <laughs> now that number is 65%. <laughs> I was wrong. Michael Ware is now the Ernie Pyle of his generation. His reporting is a testament to what we all did. And if it, it's not for men and women like Michael Ware, our story would have gone unremarked. Most of the men I just described got little or no recognition for their valor. In subsequent deployments, some would lose their lives years later. It is our duty to tell the story of our brave men and women who sacrificed so much for our fellow citizens. As I've tried to communicate to you today, this is not a celebration about me. I'm not mouthing a cliche. We have much more work to do when it comes to the Iraq war veteran. We are not there yet, and we're not even close when it comes to educating our fellow Americans about what was accomplished, what was sacrificed, and what we all went through. Our survival as a nation depends on it. We honor our brothers and sisters in the United States Marine Corps. Ambar Province was their fight. Men like Brad Castle, Rafael Peralta, Christopher Applesberger, Brian Shantosh, Jeremiah Workman, Sergeant Kraft, they gave the enemy everything they could handle. The Navy and Air Force completed the remarkable display of American valor and might and fought shoulder to shoulder in the, with the United States Army in Fallujah and all over Iraq. This entire military is one cohesive, dedicated force. And the threats to our nations, they don't sleep. They're watching our every move, Iran, Russia, China, North Korea, ISIS, Al Qaeda. They may be watching this right now. Our military should not be mistaken for a cable news gab fest show. We don't care what you look like. We don't care who you voted for, who you worship, what you worship, who you love. It doesn't matter if your dad left you millions when he died or if he knew who your father was. We have been honed into a machine of lethal moving parts that you would be wise to avoid if you know what's good for you. We will not be intimidated. We will not back down. We've seen war. We don't want war. 
But if you want war with the United States of America, there's one thing I can promise you, so help me God. Someone else will raise your sons and daughters. We fight. We fight so our children never have to. We fight for one day when our children and our enemies' children can discuss their differences without fear or loathing. We fight so that anyone out there thinking about raising arms against our citizens or allies realize the futility of attrition against a disciplined, professional, and lethal force built to withstand anything you can dream of throwing at us. Americans want this kind of country. Americans want this kind of world. And we stand ready to defend it, to protect us. So help us, God. May God bless this beautiful army. May God bless our Marine Corps, our Navy, our Air Force and Coast Guard. May God bless our allies. And we already know that God blessed America because he gave us the greatest fighting force this world has ever seen, 2-2 Infantry of the 1st Infantry Division. Thank you, Ramrods, Duty First, Dukes. Thank you very much.